coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. Here's the main thing. It's that DeSantis, he's a model of like effective Trumpism, I would say. Like here's a guy who sees who the enemies are and is willing to take the battle to them and willing to fight as hard as they are um, and to find his own terms, you know, to achieve total victory, total but local victory, you know, not giving uh, a little and then losing a lot. So I, I like the model of what DeSantis is doing. Hello, and welcome once again to The Roundtable, your weekly editors and publishers podcast from The American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, Features Editor of The American Mind, and I am joined this week by James Poulos, our editor uh, from Florida, and from New York by our managing editor, Seth Barron. It's a very online episode this week, or rather perhaps the theme of the episode is online is real life. Um, all three of the topics we want to cover have to do with a kind of porous boundary between very online discourse and real life politics with real life consequences. And so we thought we'd start um, with Taylor Lorenz's pinned tweet. Now, Taylor Lorenz, for those of you who don't know, is a columnist at the Washington Post, formerly of the New York Times, generally kind of reviled among conservatives for her uh, terrible takes and for her uh, sort of woke, vaguely woke posturing. Um, cry bullying is a word that gets used a lot. She was recently featured in a, an interview, you know, breaking down into tears about the doxing and the, you know, w the harassment that women face online. Her beat is sort of internet culture, online journalism. And lo and behold, shortly after revealing her sorrowful story, her sob tale of, you know, having been attacked by people who don't like her work online. She comes out with this story now pinned to the top of her Twitter timeline um, about the Twitter account at Libs of TikTok. You can find this on The Washington Post, meet the woman behind Libs of TikTok, full on doxing this anonymous uh, tipster, the, the person who runs this Libs of TikTok account, um, at, you know, doxing typically just sort of means revealing the identity of somebody who prefers to remain anonymous online, although there has been some sort of hair splitting about, well, this person's, you know, personal information was available. But Lorenz seems to have done some really heinous stuff like going to the houses, the house of her family members. And um, it just in point of fact, the to read this story, um, is kind of remarkable for the barely concealed venom. It's, it's sort of masquerading as a as a news story. Libs of TikTok, if you haven't found an indispensable resource, as long as it remains on Twitter, basically all the person does behind it, and I, you, you know, you can find her name. I I won't say it because I don't want to dignify this this stuff. But you know, the, um, th this incredible woman uh, re just posting like clips of things on, from TikTok that have revealed an enormous amount to an enormous number of people about how deep, especially the kind of uh, alphabet crazy trans extremist stuff goes in um, public schools. And one of the things that you can do if, if somebody ever says, well, nobody's really teaching about, you know, uh, about gender transition to third graders, you can go on Libs of TikTok and find teachers <laughs> on TikTok saying about how they teach gender transition to third graders or, you know, basically anything that you can you can dream of. Um, this person has found just evidence of it and just posts these clips. I mean, th there's some commentary associated, but really it's just the videos to read this this story on The Washington Post. Right. You, you get the sense that this is this sort of sinister project of of posting things, You're feeding the right wing outrage machine. This anonymous account I'm, I'm going to read from the story now, the anonymous accounts impact is deep and far reaching. Its content is amplified by high profile media figures, politicians and right wing influence 
influencers. Its tweets reach millions, with influence spreading far beyond its more than 648,000 Twitter followers. It has become an agenda setter in right-wing online discourse, and the content it surfaces shows a direct correlation with the recent push in legislation and rhetoric directly targeting the LGBTQ plus community. So, uh, you know, there's there's some truth to this in the sense that, in fact, you often now see videos that are uncovered by libs of TikTok on Fox News or on Tucker, especially to the effect that some of this legislation, the parents' rights legislation to protect kids against uh, indoctrination and so forth, like, is, is highly necessary. Um, and this is not just some sort of conspiracy theory in the conservative media's head. So this is the state of play at the moment. There's been all sorts of online back and forth about it, but it is kind of intriguing to find this person turn around from, you know, oh, it's so sad and, and awful to be doxxed, to be pursued online, um, and then to invite this exact kind of um, opposition by identifying somebody who wishes to remain anonymous simply for the crime of doing the reporting that it should be noted Taylor Lorenz is is really ideologically and probably professionally incapable of doing i mean this is the libs of tiktok is is more uh, you know, powerful as internet journalism than anything Lorenz herself has ever written. So this is all to summarize the state of play. Um, what do you guys make of it? Is this, I mean, one thing that's going on also is that the Babylon Bee has announced a partnership with the woman behind Libs of TikTok. And so it seems as if the right is really rallying around her. To me, this is an interesting barometer moment for the relative power of kind of the cathedral behemoths of big tech and uh, mainstream journalism and, you know, legacy media against these kind of groundswell conservative movements. Um, and I'm interested to know what you guys think about what this says vis-a-vis -vis kind of where those two movements stand. Well, uh, I mean, I guess I'd start out by saying that this ate my Twitter feed. Uh, this is like day two or three where, you know, I've pretty ruthlessly i mean it's the only way to survive really on twitter is you just keep keep winnowing down the people you follow and it's down to about 900 and i think every single person in my feed was discussing this for several days and and part of me you know cringes to the depths of my soul in the face of this spectacle but there are some interesting issues and one of them is you know there's there's been a pivot uh, over the past 24 hours or, or so it seems away from kind of the, the ground level reality of what's going on up to this sort of meta layer where it's like, well, what's really going on is conservatives hate journalism. They don't think that it's a legitimate profession, I guess. And uh, what they want is chaos on the internet, anarchy online, uh, where anyone can say anything at any time, including, you know, the kind of craziest misinformation out there, let God sort it out. And uh, this is a meme that's starting to spread through the, the kind of journosphere. And what's interesting to me is like, on the one hand, yes, it's true that there are, you know, good reasons to actually say that like journalism, legacy journalism is this kind of historical phenomenon. You know, the fourth estate is this kind of thing that appeared over time and the idea of the fourth estate is, you know, this is basically like a, a group of people who have an equal significance to like the first three estates, those who work, those who pray, those who fight and have like an equal amount of authority in how society is structured. That's like, you know, that's a question mark as to whether like legacy journalism still has and merits a claim to that level of authority in society. So that's like right off the top. On the other hand, like it's not just sort of a, a political question. You know, there's this there's this uh, media question as to, you know, given the current technological landscape, what is journalism and and what it isn't is what what it has been presented as for the past, you know, several decades, this kind of almost a branch of government. That's, you know, not even those who work, those who pray and those who fight had a claim to be a branch of government in the way that I think journalists of a certain establishmentarian stripe, see themselves to be, think of themselves as being performing this kind of regulatory function, uh, a, a, the, the kind of, you know, barometer of truthiness um, in political discourse. Things are changing. And despite the, uh, the panic over misinformation and disinformation, as we all know, uh, vast quantities of propaganda that is deliberate in its intention to mislead millions and millions of people for political reasons is coming, you know, the call is coming from inside the house. It's coming from institutional journalism. And so journalists face this kind of predicament. How do they present themselves? What do they talk about? What do they cover? 
And how do they do it all in a way that one, maintains their prestige and status, status, two, keeps them at a certain kind of socioeconomic tier of society, and three, um, gives them the political uh, significance and power that they need in order to maintain this kind of affectation that they are an institutional pillar of, quote unquote, our democracy. And so all this is to say, you know, the way that uh, it looks like they're trying to play this under the uh, the the episode that we're discussing right now is to say, like, well, look, anyone who questions or attacks or challenges or even ridicules queerness as you know, as what what John Rawls might call a comprehensive doctrine, what I might call like a religion. Anyone who challenges that or says anything other than, you know, the the the, the proper sort of set of litur- liturgical phrases must be exposed, exposed to um, to to public notoriety it has forfeited their 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 right to anonymity or even just garden variety privacy. And that it is, in effect, a sacred function of our democracy, quote unquote, for journalism to do this. Um, that really seems to be the logic that they're going with. And, you know, I don't I mean, you do not have to be very online. You do not have to be a conservative. You do not have to be a member of the new right, which is the phrase of the moment. You can just be an ordinary American to look at that logic and to say this is suspect. It is sus. And uh, and I oppose it. And why wouldn't I oppose it? And uh, on what basis do you expect the American people to embrace this sort of behavior? And I, I think there, there there is no such basis. And uh, and so, you know, we'll see how this all shakes out. Uh, but I think that they're on very thin ice. Yeah, I agree. I mean, especially because I mean, what's so funny is that it's not even really like you can't criticize like any criticism of you know, the trans religion or, you know, these these weird gender commissars is hateful. Because the whole thing with um, libs of TikTok is that it's it's kind of just she's just collating stuff that they're putting out there. So it's even that just to look at it, you know, just to, just to look at their own content, but in the wrong frame is hateful. I mean, Taylor Lorenz herself demonstrated this when, okay, she had this interview, you know, this famous, infamous interview where she started weeping about all the harassment she gets. And it was from a totally sympathetic softball reporter, the outlet, I guess it was MSNBC or NBC. But the whole thing was like this tear fest of all these women journalists, including the host, complaining about all the hate they get. But then when Taylor, when it backfired and people were laughing at her for her cry bully ship, she turned around and attacked the, um, the host of the, this segment, <clears throat> saying that if you, you don't under, if you don't understand online culture well enough not to do something that's going to expose your subject to more hate, then you, you know, effed up. So she's like saying that this journalist I mean, basically, Taylor Lorenz is making it like, it's interesting how the journalists have, like the whole narrative about, you know, uh, safe spaces for vulnerable people, it's all circled down to just become about them. Mm -hmm. Um, They are the ultimate vulnerable people. The journalists who are daring to cover, you know, go to a, daring to read through Trump's tweets or, you know, or dox the uh, like the the person behind some some anonymous account. They are the brave ones. They are the truly scorned and miserable. You know, Jimmy Dore, the comedian who's done a very good podcast. He was saying, like, I mean, Taylor Lorenz. You know, she she's from a very wealthy background. She went to a Swiss boarding school. She's she's like a reporter at the New York Times and now the Washington Post. And the idea that she is somehow the wretched of the earth, like it, it's it just beggars belief. I mean, the whole thing, it's like the rage, rage of T- Taylor Lorenz seeing herself in the mirror. Um, like she, it, 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 it's 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 like we can't look. It's, it's really a question of like how are, you may like may a cat look at a king, you know, I, apparently not. I, mm. I guess not. 
Yeah, this is a really interesting dimension of it all that, in fact, what the crime here is just presented. I mean, it's true that Lives of TikTok, you know, has a point of view and offers commentary, but I don't think I've ever once read in any detail the actual text of a Lives of TikTok tweet. Like, it's really just the video. All she's doing is putting it, you click on the thing, you hear what they say. And this is, in some ways, a microcosm of the phenomenon that happened nationwide during covid when kids were forced to do school at home everything was online they were zooming into class and parents were simply <laughs> they weren't like spying on teachers or you don't have to put like cameras into classrooms you know, they all they did was just like sit in the kitchen while their kid was doing homework because that's how things were during the pandemic <laughs> and now they're they're freaking out because the parents are like well we we don't really like what you said and this was you know terry mcauliffe when terry mcauliffe said like parents shouldn't have any input at all he was reacting to exactly this phenomenon that you know when parents send their kids to school they enter into a relationship of trust with the teachers they delegate some amount of their parental authority which is given to them by god uh, they delegate some of that authority unto these people and the trust that they'll take care of them and to their kids and not you know whisper in their ear about stuff that they don't want their you know we don't want your parents to know don't tell your parents but boys can be girls like you know and and so all th that is happening from covid to zoom class to libs of tiktok to to anything else is, is simply that people are reporting, finding out, discovering for themselves the actual things that are going on, which, by the way, is supposed to be the job of journalists. Like the grand irony here is that journalists job, uh, it, you know, it, they too have a sacred trust. And if they're going to be afforded the honor and prestige of the fourth estate of the, the pillar of of uh, liberal democracies, pillar of society, um, then they have to fulfill the trust of simply as far insofar as possible, presenting the facts to the people and letting them decide. And since they've completely fallen down on that job, since they've made it their mission to undo any any attempt that people might ha make at getting at the truth, since they've totally you know fallen down on their duties, it's been up to parents and to citizen journalists and to random people like uh, libs of TikTok to actually present what's going on in in the plainest possible terms to just give it to you on camera. Um, and and you know, the the grand irony is that like, oh, yes, like we journalists, we're the real heroes here um, for persecuting people for doing journalism. I just want to add that, you know, there's there's a another thing that's sort of floating around the Internet at the moment, very much to both Seth's and James points is a, a photo shoot by New York magazine of the new executive editor of The New York Times, which truly must be seen to be believed. I mean, I don't know if you've seen Titanic lately, but the thing where she's like, paint me like one of your French girls and she languishes in, in seductive pose. That's sort of the, the stances that these that this guy's taking and, and tells you exactly kind of how they have come to view themselves. Not not that they you know, are important in society because they fulfill a sacred trust, but that they are among the anointed, right? I mean, everybody wants in on the oligarchic class and being a journalist, ipso facto, whether or not you actually do journalism, is supposed to confer you that favored status. And at this point, people are saying like, you know, well, to hell with that. Like, what, you know, what do we keep you people around for? Like, apparently not to report the news, apparently only to persecute people who do report the news. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit bullish about just normies and people in general uh, catching wise to this stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is just it's constructing a new regime and it's constructing a new regime for a digital world. And this is how they intend to do it. Either you have the blue check or you don't. This is exactly the same logic that's playing out with uh, central bank digital currency. You know, it looks like they're going to be rolling out a full blown social credit system in Bologna, Italy coming soon uh, with the EU not far behind. I mean, this stuff is happening and the logic is is plain and the logic is this. You know, I look, I, I will toot my own horn and be a broken record at the same time. Why stop now? Mm -hmm. uh, 2014, 2015, when I was uh, sort of talking about pink police state stuff uh, before uh, the digital world really uh, swallowed us all. Um, the main uh, kind of you know political theory point there is we were exiting a world where the the public private distinction was what ordered society, and moving into a world where where the distinction between official and unofficial life replaced the public private distinction, and that's what we got, and that's what's being used to make these decisions about who's you know who's in the regime and who's not, who's doing the governance and who's not. It's, you know, it's, it's going to be who has the, the badging on their online identity and who does not and uh, who gets to decide who receives the badge and who doesn't. 
Well, you know, what's the logic that's going to determine that particular, you know, algorithm? Um, and, it, you know, it really looks like it's just going to come down to, you know, uh, if you're part of this kind of ecclesiastical hierarchy of this new religion that they're constructing, one where certain identities are not just to be tolerated, not just to be accepted, but must be celebrated, are, are considered exemplary identities, ruling identities. Identities uh, that that are models, uh, which which everyone who you know, whether you're in the the governance class or not, must emulate. I mean, mu either by by joining these identities as a matter of of uh, of volition, or uh, you basically conversion at sword point, or by doing it sort of through technology. Increasingly, you're going to have to do that if you want you know if you want your social credit score to be halfway decent. Uh, if you want to get ahead in life, you know, they, it is it is a, a requirement to uh, to conform and to compete for the prizes of of better and better conformity. People are making a big mistake if they think that this is something that, you know, well, the Chinese have always been unlike us. And I guess in some ways, you know, this this uniformity is just baked in. I mean, you know, maybe there's some evidence the, the, of that if you go back through the historical record and definitely, you know, Europeans who are trying to sort through the logic of uh, of democratic institutionalism in the uh, the 19th and 20th centuries, even, uh, you know, whether it's it's Alexis de Tocqueville or um, Friedrich Nietzsche, I mean, there was this concern that, oh, you know, maybe maybe modernity is going to make everyone uniform in a way that we can only really analogize to China. Perhaps so. But this is definitely not just something that happens over on the other side of the planet. Uh, we have no shortage of kind of, you know, theological and philosophical reasons right here, you know, native to the, the West that lead us in this direction. Um, it has been tried before in different ways. Just ask the French, you know, it's a Saint Simon and Comte and all those guys were uh, were headed in this direction long ago. The Gnostic elements of the official religion that we're dealing with have been present for longer than that, uh, and it's all coming to a head. So you know, ultimately, everyone's right when they say that this is concerning. Of course, I think the next level that we need to take the conversation to is uh, you know, is this graft going to take? Is is the American body politic capable of permitting this kind of you know structure? to be integrated into its uh, into its being. Uh, it's evidence uh, is mounting on both sides. It's I think the jury's still out. But but my bet is that, in fact, the graft will not take an evidence for this is that the people who are the most accepting and embracing of this new regime are the people who, let's face it, seem to be psychologically the least stable, really frantic and damaged and fragile people. And uh, and those, you know, who are, who are willing to pretend to be that way uh, in order to get ahead. Well, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say one quick thing. Uh, I mean, in support of the idea that the plans to, you know, impose social credit systems and all of that on us are valid is, um, I mean, it kind of reminds me like when COVID first started. And we saw these horrible scenes of lockdowns in China. And the sense was like, well, all right, but that's not going to happen here. Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I follow that model. Like, I, I, I don't see us as like um, uh, so radically different. But I, I agree with you that it's, it's that there are problems with our I mean, I don't know if they're problems or features with our system that might make it difficult to uh, really impose it. And, and particularly like, you know, I, I feel like the hysteria of Taylor Lorenz at the idea that someone is saying mean things about her and the injustice of it and her inability to cope at all. Like I, that, that, that's salutary. You know, if that's what the, if that's how the elites deal with a little bit of um, pushback, well, then I think we might be in good shape. Uh, yeah, I mean, very much in this vein, both in the vein of kind of people catching wise, figuring out what's going on, uh, finally getting access to the reality of what's happening here. And, uh, you know, in the white pill promising vein of uh, there actually is a fair amount of will and, and desire still out there to to roll this stuff back. And the tools and mechanisms are at our disposal if we will use them to reclaim a truly American way of handling things like tech. We wanted to talk about this latest move by DeSantis. We've been 
kind of tracking for a while now this uh, back and forth, you know, gutter damarung conflict of the gods um, over over the parental rights bill, this bill that you know, the legislature in Florida, um, again, you've heard me summarize this a million times, the legislature in Florida has passed a law that you can't talk to kids, um, you know, inappropriately about sex and uh, transgender stuff and variant sexualities um, uh, until fourth grade and only in an age appropriate manner, right? I mean, it's basically a law to prevent these libs of TikTok teachers um, from telling your kids stuff that you don't want them told uh, or in a way that you don't want them told or, you know, before they're ready, so on and so forth. We have documented in some length and discussed the furor of outrage, the, the keening of sorrow that has come from the left about this, the OK Groomer debate, the sort of rightward push on this, all salutary in our view. And we also talked about the fact that Disney was kind of pressured by some of its woker employees, uh, even all the way up the executive ladder as well to uh, commit to making yet more gay content, you know, more LGBTQ stuff, more alphabet people in the movies. Um, and this is, uh, no, you know, understandably amplified the debate. The latest in this is that DeSantis, <clears throat> governor of Florida and all American hero, has directed the legislature who are meeting soon for a special session to consider rolling back the Reedy Creek uh, district privileges. And this is something which uh, I, at least, when I first heard him talk about this, had no idea what was going on. I, I, maybe it's just the bias of my particular Twitter feed, but I don't feel like it has gotten enough play and attention yet. Uh, this Reedy Creek thing, which I had never heard of before, it turns out to be a, basically a, a government run by Disney, a county government that was given to Walt Disney World Company when they proposed to bring all this revenue in by you know, moving Walt Disney World to Orlando or starting this theme park in Orlando. You, if you look on a map at Reedy Creek, it's a sizable region comparable to Orlando itself, 38.5 square miles, within which, you know, they're <laughs> en enabled to just do, you know, run their own government, essentially, an autonomous government. It's been called the Vatican with mouse ears. Um, you might also compare it to like, a, you know, an Indian reservation. Just this, you know, weirdly extreme grant of privilege from the Florida government. This is the sort of thing that, you know, the left, uh, the principled left, had we won, you know, of, of old, would be going berserk about. And in fact, you know, as I was looking into this, I did find this book, Married to the Mouse, um, in which that's where that phrase, the Vatican with mouse ears, comes from is by Rick Fogelsong. I just want to read a little bit of it to give a sense of what this is. On the cost side, writes Fogelsong, Disney World has generated traffic congestion, public facility deficits, affordable housing shortages, and a low-wage economy. These problems frequently accompany urban growth, but there is a complicating factor in this Disney Orlando case. For the Disney company got something special in coming to Florida, their own private government, a sort of Vatican with mouse ears, with powers and immunities that exceeded nearby Orlando's. The entertainment titan was authorized, among other things, to regulate land use, provide policies and fire services, build roads, lay sewer lines, license the manufacturer and sale of alcoholic beverage, even to build an airport and a nuclear power plant. Now, some of these things they haven't actually taken advantage of, but the principle remains in place. And this is what DeSantis is suggesting is, look, we granted you these privileges because we thought you could come in and benefit our state. It turns out that, you, in fact, you have uh, some hostilities toward the will of the people and you're not in, working in our interest, no matter how much money you might generate. Um, and therefore, you know, the, the deal's off. You're not holding up your end of the bargain. Um, I, the the part about this that I'm really looking forward to is the part where, you know, as this news gets out, it's it, it will turn out, I imagine, that the left suddenly discovers that, you know, in order for democracy and freedom and equality to be preserved, multi-gajillion dollar companies need to be able to build their own power plants. Um, but I actually also wonder whether this is a way for the right, some of the kind of more normy right that maybe remembers the Reagan era and is in favor of big business generally or just business. Um, to, to kind of recognize that not only Disney, but also any number of 
tech companies are not simply, you know, just doing so great in the free market that everybody loves them, they have all this power, but are in fact in deals with governments that enable them to grow as large as they grow. And that those privileges, in fact, can be revoked. They don't come from God. They're not, you know, part of our natural rights. They're, they're sort of special privileges that are granted. So I'm really interested in this case. I, I, I'm interested to see whether the, um, the legislature does roll some of this stuff back and end this weird uh, papal carve out for Disney. Uh, DeSantis, you know, has said following, you know, the best laws of general incorporation, like we're not going to take away any privileges that you could get it, it, that any company could have. But we are going to start looking, it turns out, at this kind of extraordinary setup. Um, what do you guys make of this? And do you think it represents a, an opportunity for the right more generally as, it, as we kind of rethink the whole we're, we're super pro business side of things? Well, yeah, definitely an opportunity. I mean, as we have seen uh, business become, in fact, anti-business, you know, corporations have become anti-business. They want to get out of out of the capitalism business and into the religion business. Uh, I don't think there's any other way of really describing what's going on. Uh, you will begin to see, um, and I think we've be begun to see, uh, and this is an example, uh, a return of some of the the classic forms of uh, of medieval conflict at the highest levels over regime authority. The the Orthodox have uh, a story about an emperor of uh, Byzantium, Eastern Roman Empire, who uh, wanted to canonize all of the soldiers who 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 died uh, in an important battle where the empire was was victorious. And uh, and the uh, the the chief priest at the time basically said, no, you can't do this. This is a religious function. And the church won won that particular battle. Um, the Catholics had the investiture controversy where the uh, the Holy Roman Empire emperor wanted to just appoint the bishops. You know, I'm I'm the emperor. I'm God's, you know, uh, political representative of uh, the Holy Roman Empire. So why shouldn't I? do this. Uh, and the church said, well, you know, it's not that simple. And there was conflict. And once again, the church won out. Yet, nevertheless, you had the papal states last for uh, for a long time, more or less until Napoleon came along. And so, uh, you know, these kinds of struggles over uh, over um, uh, institutional authority uh, in the context of uh, the dominant political theology will continue. They will grow in in under color of of uh, of corporate organization and and uh and the power of quote-unquote stakeholders to make uh basically political decisions and uh and decisions about which creed is institutionalized in which uh institutions and you know this stuff is is not within the american tradition and you have these kinds of freakish episodes like what became of disney and at the time disney was was unlike any other corporation that had existed the whole move that Disney made uh, out of TV and into real life was unlike anything that had been seen before. There was one Disneyland in the, the known universe. And in a lot of ways, you know, uh, American corporate life took that, um, that exemplar and uh, has been imitating it quite hard ever since. And so for DeSantis or anyone else to kind of strike at the heart of the weird arrangement that was a creature of its time uh, and which has in some ways become this kind of hideous template cloning itself uh, across America and, and, you know, throughout the world under American cultural authority is a powerful move. And it's one that, that would at a, at a critical point um, return uh, corporate America uh, back into the realm of business properly understood which, um, you know, I, I think uh, still a majority of Americans would basically agree that that's where it needs to go. Yeah, I like the way you put that, James. I mean, the way I see it, it it's like the American right got duped starting maybe 50 years ago. And we were told that we were in favor of free markets. And free markets was really the, the main thing. Now, free markets, you know, I guess that sounds good. And it's got like, you know, it's got some um, heritage to it. But I think what we, we're, we're really in favor of is free enterprise. Like, yes, if people should be free to start businesses. Businesses should be free to run as businesses. And, you know, 
participate in the economy and so forth and so on. And, you know, the, this idea of uh, individual liberty and, and all of that kind of like old fashioned, like Main Street Republicanism. Free markets uh, sort of gets more of what, what, what you were saying, James, about like wanting to get out of the business of being in business. Like who wants to be in business? Let's just like set ourselves up as like the permanent monopoly, like ally ourselves to the state and call it the free market. And look, anything that that chops away at these orthodoxies and kind of, you know, brings us back to, you know, I don't know, some vision I have of like, OK, maybe call it babbitry, whatever. Um, basically, a Main Street Republicanism. That's great. If it means taking away Disney's, you know, special domain, fine. I, I mean, I gather like there is a problem in that. Because Disney, you know, the Reedy, this, 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 this improvement district or whatever you call it has can bond, right? So there's like $2 billion of outstanding bonds. And if you dissolved it, then the obligation would fall on like basically the, 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 the people who live in those counties. So, I mean, that's kind of an issue. I mean, I mean, whenever you dissolve states or entities like this, there is always the question of what do you do about the debt? So they, they'll have to, they'd have to figure that out. But here's the main thing. It's that DeSantis, he's a model of like effective Trumpism, I would say. Like here's a guy who sees who the enemies are and is willing to take the battle to them and willing to fight as hard as they are. Um, and define his own terms, you know, to achieve total victory, total but local victory, you know, not giving uh, a little and then losing a lot. So I, I like the model of what DeSantis is doing. I mean, you notice the other thing that he's doing is, I, I'm not exactly sure what the details are, but apparently he's forcing through his own re redistricting plan for Florida's House seats, you know, countering what they're doing in Maryland and New York and all these other blue states where they're, they're just like wiping out Republican seats. Well, he's doing the same thing to them. And essentially, from what I gather in Cook's political report, it's going to be a wash. Or maybe Larry Sabato said this, like he's, he's essentially righted the entire like Democrat power grab. I mean, this guy, you know, if he can really do this, I mean, he's really somebody to watch. I mean, that's terrific. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the debt thing, I have no idea whether they will figure out a way to resolve that. It's, it's an actual concern because it, it, it is a problem for the people of Florida, not for Disney, right? I mean, like, the, who knows? I'm, I'm not the like legal scholar to figure out if there's some way around that for them. But me, to me, the point is simply like that he has undertaken to put this on the table, right? I mean, right. it is as you say, it's it's this thing where he actually thinks up ways, effective ways of going after the enemies of the people um, that are like within the best American traditions. I mean, I liked the. Uh, the theological kind of context you were giving, James. I uh, the other historical parallel that came to my mind here was the East India Trading Company. I mean, I was <laughs> on Twitter talking with our friend uh, Richard Samuelson, who's a you know Claremont writes for Claremont and um, a, a among a number of other things, and we were sort of going back and forth about you know one of the whole problems about. The East India Trading Company, which Burke famously sort of spoke about in in Parliament, was not that the sovereign had granted them a monopoly or that the sovereign had granted them special incorporation, both of which were, you know, perfectly within the normal scope of, of British law, but that under the heading of that, you know, privilege that they had received from the crown, they were effectively delegating privileges into governments in places like, you know, India uh, and and setting up, setting themselves up as a sort of parastate 
entity, which is simply like not on like the no, no, um, no theory of contract law, be it special incorporation or the kind of general incorporation that we've ended up with can can countenance the idea that because the government like grants certain privileges to certain companies out of its own interest, therefore, those those companies get to kind of run away with that power and become uh, like little little arms of the government. And I think that's basically the situation that we're facing with big tech as well. You know, if, as we've discussed, us, as James has illuminated frequently on the show, like, you know, th these are companies that were uh, hurled, money was hurled at them for all sorts of intelligence gathering reasons, you know, total information awareness after 9-11, even going back to DARPA and all this stuff, which, you know, you can adjudicate the legitimacy of the aims of those particular products to no end. But in fact, like what you end up with is these companies that have been built up to the level effectively of, of kind of quasi state actors who then use their power to, to basically silence people and you, you get Jen Psaki uh, up at the podium saying, you know, these, this COVID misinformation, these are some of the posts that we're flagging for Facebook. Like, who will rid me of, of this meddlesome priest? And, and yeah, I think the more that people can realize that that's kind of what's going on here, that we're not dealing with, you know, of course, we're in favor of free enterprise. We believe you have a divine right to your property, to association. All of these things are completely within the, you know, the best traditions of the founding. But that doesn't, you know, why are we in favor of the, quote unquote, the free market. It's because we're in favor of, of free enterprise, as Seth is saying, and not simply because it generates these massive amounts of wealth for like corporate oligarchs who then become not only like, you know, adjuncts of the state, but a state essentially unto themselves. Yes, well put. Uh, Edmund Burke distinguished himself as one of these guys. He said, like, look, you know, you think it's all fun and games out in India, but it corrupts our men. And then they come back here and they spread those sort of, you know, degen values that were the result of this kind of weird arrangement where you get to have your cake and eat it too. And, uh, you know, the, the U.S. military industrial regime has been that kind of weird arrangement and, uh, and under its cover, you know, all kinds of, of gross and, uh, and exploitative things have, have grown. I mean, just, you know, look at the Clintons. This is what that world produces. And there are many more of those folks besides the Clintons doesn't mean everyone's a criminal or, you know, whatever, but it's a, uh, it's a culture. It's an institutionalized culture and we're paying the price. You know, when Trump was first elected, I kind of, I got this like kind of like little vision in my head that what we would do is we would set up um, tents all on the mall, like old world war one army surplus tents and like uh, men of goodwill from across the country would come to the, the mall and we would we would all sleep in the tents and go to work during the day to clean out the swamp. This I mean this was just a little <laughs> fantasy I had, but you know, obviously that didn't happen. But would would that would that it were? Would that it were? Yeah. I mean, this is I, I like Seth, what you said about like this is effective Trumpism and and I mean DeSantis is surely ha, has surely emerged as the leading candidate for that. You know, where where does Trumpism go? In the, of the time that remains to us, uh, in keeping with the theme of it, the internet becoming real life, we wanted to discuss a clip, um, which you may or may not have seen some promotional material for one of Tucker Carlson's, uh, I guess it's kind of one of his specials. It's called the Tucker Carlson original. And it, it made the rounds on the internet because it's a very striking clip. This is a, a, basically a segment or a show that Carlson is doing on, quote, the end of men, uh, the you know, this whole thing about sort of denigration of manhood via toxic masculinity, um, but also, you know, declining uh, rates of fertility and like lower testosterone levels. Um, and he's got this like, you know, sequence, this montage of really ripped dudes like working out and doing jujitsu, it looks like MMA and chopping wood and <laughs> indeed, uh, forgive me, but sunning their testicles. This is an <laughs> online thing um, that he got. It's actually, I guess, not sunning so much as uh, as like they've got infrared light, which apparently is one of the things that uh, people recommend for for health, all sorts of health benefits. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention, the last piece of this clip is is egg slonking uh which if you haven't tried i highly recommend it's just drinking raw eggs it's supposed to get you some of the benefits of like the choline and so forth and um this is this is an area of like of of nerding out for me so i i won't go into too much detail except to just outline that 
one of the things that this is that it's striking about this that both you know those in the know on the right and those who are uh, anti masculinity anti Tucker etc on the left um, have been remarking upon is that you know the, people who are online a lot will recognize in this sequence all sorts of tropes from whatever you want to call it the vitalist right the online sort of masculinist world. Um, you know, accounts like soul bra and, of course, Bronze Age pervert and but even, you know, more mainstream stuff that's a little bit even less political, like Order of Man with by, with Ryan Mickler or don't forget you know, a raw egg nationalist. Who's written yes, thank you. Our, our our own. Uh, I shouldn't say our own, but he wrote for us raw egg nationalist. Um, uh, and yeah. So, in fact, Bronze Age pervert has written for us. And I, I think that we in general at Claremont should feel rather vindicated that you know, we were way ahead of the curve on this. Uh, Mike Anton review. Bronze Age Pervert's book, I mean, back when I was first starting here. So that's what, like two years ago or so. Um, and we've, as we pointed out at the time, you know, this culture of, in which it's sort of summarily uh, assumed that wanting to be a man is evil and wrong, wanting to be manly, saying that boys should grow up to be manly and should be trained in this, um, as they have been throughout all of history. All of this is an evidence of to toxic masculinity. You can read, you know, on USA Today, for instance, uh, <laughs> Tucker Carlson is putting this out and experts say that this is the wrong, this is part of the problem. Like hyper masculinity has been linked. Uh, MSNBC said, you know, you know who else liked jujitsu? Like Hitler liked jujitsu um, because uh, fascism and hyper masculinity are connected as Theodore. Adorno taught us. And so anyway, uh, this is just to go into a long winded way of saying that it seems that Tucker, uh, once again, is serving a little bit as a bridge between the very online right, which has realized that there's a severe need for an antidote to this uh, anti-masculine culture and the more you might, you might call normie right who watches Fox News. And so, yeah, this is an interesting, I mean, my only like immediate take on it is <laughs> one of the most fascinating things is that you you can encourage any gender expression in on the left, right? Any sort of, if you want to be a girl, if you want to yeah, take hormones, whatever. Um, but the one gender expression that is evil and fascist to encourage is masculinity. To, to say to the little boys, like, you know, you, you, if a little boy comes and says, I want to be a man, that's the one thing you have to say, like, oh, no, no, like, that's not allowed. Anyway, um, I found this, this sort of interesting as a, as a bridge between online and offline culture. What did you guys make of it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, somebody pointed out to me once that, um, if you're a woman and you want to get estrogen, that's fine. If you're a woman and you want to get testosterone, that's fine. <laughs> if you're a man and you want to get estrogen, that's fine. But if you're a man and you want to get testosterone, it's good luck. I yeah. mean, they, 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 they jump you through hoops. It's really difficult. I mean, I, I haven't tried, but this is what I understand. It's, they basically will restrict it. It's, 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 they don't want you having it. You know, what Tucker's doing, I think he's kind of, you know, like like when he has his segments about UFOs. Yeah. You know, I think he's kind of pulling the culture's leg a bit. Um, you know, like, all right, I'll I'll play the National Enquirer bit. You know, why not? People like it. It's interesting. And, you know, if, if it if it pushes the Overton window a little bit, maybe that's not such a bad thing. What I think is funny is the kind of, you know, gawker type of media that, you know, the, 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 all, the all too knowing, this hyper sophisticated, you know, online world looks at Tucker and kind of smirks and kind of scoffs. And they're like, oh, my God, does he realize how homoerotic this is? Yeah, right. As though that aspect eluded Tucker or eluded the right. <laughs> like, yeah, we, we get that. We, we, we get what your smirks are about. That's not the point. Like we can, like our side is broad. We can incorporate all kinds of implications and it doesn't really, it doesn't like bother us. It's like, whatever. Sure. Yes. It's, is it a little like odd to like sun one's testicles? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, okay. never having tried it, I couldn't. I couldn't say Seth. I, I couldn't either. But yeah. it's it's funny that um, it's funny to, to to see what rubs them the wrong way, yeah. and what gets their like panties in a twist, basically. So yeah, I mean, I'm all in favor of it.
I totally, yes. I want to talk about this like homoerotic thing. I mean, of course, of course, as you say, Tucker is a very like self-aware person. He does not put this stuff out with no sense of what's going on. Um, but there is something really perverse about it too, where it's like the, the left is, is just so fanatical about like, you know, gay people, it's, it ought to be okay to be gay. The, the, their first insult is always like, you're a closeted homosexual, which if, if in fact you are the champions, <laughs> if you are the champions of, you know, inclusion and you have this big heart of compassion for these kids that aren't really, you know, that are growing up in these conservative cultures, like, shouldn't you, shouldn't you say like, oh, Tuck, if anything, if you think that Tucker is like working out some sort of uh, sexual dis dysfunction or like, you know, uh, closet homosexuality, shouldn't you be saying like, yes, like, you know, the culture is really being, no, no, like you're, you're gay, like that's, you're gay. And, and the other thing is that, you know, sure, there's uh, since time immemorial, there has been a kind of blurry dividing line between like homosocial and homoerotic activities. Like there is an element where like guys get when they get together and this is, goes way before the Internet, like the drum circle thing. You know, it, it, it looks a little gay. People get a little like skeevy about it. Um, but that's precisely why, like the fact that guys do feel a little antsy about, you know, showing affection to one another, like, you know, hanging out together uh, is, is precisely why, like, men actually do need to, like, be, you know, form close friendships without fearing that they're going to be perceived as gay or whatever. And so this this weird thing where everything has to be about some sort of Freudian sublimation, sexual desire. And so they mock you for just like wanting to like whatever, form male friendships is surely the the major obstacle. You know, again, they always accusing men of like, you're so, you know, you have so many hang ups. Like you don't want to, you know, you, you wanna, men don't want to show emotion. That's toxic masculinity. Men don't want to form friendships. That's toxic masculinity. And then the minute that like Tucker comes out or anybody comes out with like, I think that men should really like, you know, wrestle with each other and form friendships. Like, that's gay. You're gay. It's like, well, why do you think they're afraid to talk about this? Anyway, the whole thing is really like uh, kind of uh, ugly and perverse. Um, yeah, I agree. Just, just you know, we can, I, I don't want to, you know, go on and on about this, but it's funny when they love to point to like Larry Craig or, mm. um, you know, people and be like, he's gay. He's gay. Oh, he's a closet. Gay. It's like, okay, well, don't you, like you said, Spencer, don't, well, so he's on your side then, right? Don't right. you feel sorry for him? Like, all right, so he's gay. I mean, whatever. Right. Like, why are you making such a big deal out of it? Uh, it it's, it's kind of a funny, um, this idea that they think that they have the monopoly on what's hip. Like, yeah. everybody knows what, like, that there's, like, gays everywhere. So, like, you're not going to surprise anybody. Everybody knows this. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, like this is the other thing. It's not as if Tucker is going to like be accused of, you know, the, the, the days are long gone where if you come on, if you're if you're an actual gay person, you come on to a straight guy, you'll get punched in the face. Like, you know, I have a million friends who have been like, oh, I asked this guy out at the gym and he was like, I'm flattered, but I'm straight. Like, this is not a thing on the right either. Like, nobody is freaking out about this. Nobody's like, ew, cooties. And and as you say, Seth, like, really, that's actually not what this is about at all, nor is it even, like, a problem. I, 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 I genuinely feel as if this is the one forbidden gender expression, like this and, um, and homemaking, right? If you go, if you stay at home with your kids, that's evil. Uh, and you're oppressed and you've been hoodwinked and you're worthless and you're staying home with cookies and teas. And if you're a guy that wants to maybe get a little bit in shape and like, you know, do some <laughs> have some male bonding like that, too, is this sort of you're evil, you're repressed, homosexual and you should be pilloried. This thing where it's like, you know, fascist to want to lift weights. I, I, I that's my favorite part of it. I love that part because it's like they've spent years telling people that getting fat and ugly is the most virtuous thing that you can do for society. And we all have to say fat is beautiful. And now people are sort of like, that's 
you know, it doesn't feel or look good. And I don't want to be like that. So I'm good. Like people like fitness. This is not a sort of invention of, of the right wing. <laughs> it's not some social construct that we fabricated. Like people like to get in shape. They like to look good. You don't have to be a supermodel, but you do have to take, take care of yourself. And like, so now, of course, people are leaning into, I mean, one of the reasons why this stuff comes across as so dialed up to 11, you know, why the masculinist stuff is so, you know, uh, like you have these big burly guys being like, yes, we're men. Like one of the reasons why that is, is because, you know, it's been so maligned and belittled that people, you know, are kind of trying to course correct in the other direction. And it's like, so yeah, so the right is where like people go if they don't want to look like fat slobs. And now it's like, well, fitness is fascist. It's like, well, who made it fascist? You basically defined your own party as the party of like, you know, obese. <laughs> I'm not to be like un unpleasant, but just like, you know, fat is beautiful. And if you say that, then you're going to become the anti fitness party. Um, this has been fun. I, I, I love these like very online stories. I think that we are about wrapping up. Thank you all for listening to The Roundtable. If you want to learn more, you can visit our websites at AmericanMind.org, Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewBooks.com, and our D.C.-based Center for the American Way of Life at DC.Claremont.org. You can donate to support the show at Claremont.org slash donate. Don't forget to rate, review, share, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you next week.